everyone! Welcome to the Chaotic Wholesome Talk Show. I am your co-host, Kate Purcell, along with my co-host, David Lee. Who's over there? Say hi, David. Hi. Hi, everybody. So, I did a fight with my sound because I didn't like how it sounded in the last couple episodes. Should be buttery smooth right now. If it's not, chat, you're awesome. Just let us know. We appreciate you. Um, as always, before we dive in, David... Do you have anything to announce other than this show that we're both um uh, the things that i have to announce are actually things for you to announce so when it is time you will announce them all right but uh the ball is rolling on a number of things that we are working on i'm very excited about and what do we do on this show david when is it um uh, the Chaotic Wholesome Talk Show, starring Kay Purcell and myself, is every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, where we talk about uh, D&D um, how-tos for both DMs and players, um, and offer insights and interview people about things that they have going on with a focus on intersectionality and inclusion. Look at you. You've, you've done some homework. Also, it's not just D&D. &D. We cover the TTRPG space yeah, but, yeah. as a whole. We love indies. I'm playing Starfinder. We, I, I have to break the habit of using D&D &D like Kleenex. Yeah, it is. I mean, and it's understandable because it's definitely a thing. Um, we are nearing the end of the month. So um, a lot of the stuff that I have to promote is like, already, I got to do a charity game, which was really cool. May or may not be doing another charity game. We'll see how that's going. Um, but you can find me uh, on new episodes of the Emergency Power Podcast every other Wednesday. The new episode is coming out on the 20th. That's when it's up next. That's tomorrow. Holy cats. Where's this day gone? What do you mean it's not Monday? I'm confused. Hi. That was a journey. Yeah. Um, so, that's really all I have to plug for once. Usually I'm talking for much longer about what I'm up to, but I mean, I guess the other thing that I'm up to is I gotta write a little review on this gorgeous thing. This is my beautiful alternate cover review copy of Tales, I'm sorry, Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel. This is uh, Wizards of the Coast new all POC book. It covers all sorts of adventures. The artwork in it is truly beautiful. Look at this blue tiger. I love me a blue tiger. Mm. Like, I, I've, I've, I used to know a guy whose uh, screen name was Sapphire Tiger. And um, I've had a thing for blue tigers ever since. Look at how, the thing I love about this is it's very, very cultural. Um, and so you end up with a lot of things that you normally don't see in a D&D book. Like, look at all of the pastels. Look at the flowers on this beautiful black man. Like, I love all of this. Just not... And, you know, there's also... There's some spoopy for you, David. David's been super into horror okay. recently. There's some spoopy yes. for you. I'm back um, down that uh, rabbit hole. Yes. So we will... I will have a full write-up of this on Gaming Trend uh, soon. I have a lot of reading to do. And yes... Look, David and I were just saying before, like in our little green room, um, that the D&D &D covers have gotten more and more impressive. And that's like doubly so for the variant covers. Like the soft shimmer on this is just incredible. It's so pretty. I love it so much. The production value is through the roof. Yes. So we will dive into that later. But today, today... We're going to talk about something that's going to be just a little tiny bit controversial. Because uh, I got some opinions on the things you should be doing between sessions. And yes. here's where, like, that makes sense, right? Here's my things you should be doing as a player and not just a GM. So obviously, if you're a GM, you got stuff to do between sessions. But I got a checklist of stuff to help make you a better player. Because everyone talks about the Matt Mercer effect. No one talks about the Liam O'Brien effect. The Marisha Ray effect. The Laura ba We talk about the Laura Bailey effect. There's a lot of chaos and dicks. Yes. But. 
David, you started off this when I when we when we pitched the idea of what are we gonna talk about this week, you were like, I got it. I got some stuff. So Okay. So as a DM, one of the things to look forward to and also one of the things to dread is the work that goes into being a DM. Um, uh, players, when you play with uh, your DM, know that for the most part, I can't speak for every DM, but for the most part, there's a lot of work that goes on before you guys start playing and in between sessions even if you're playing a pre-prepared module. Um, there's a lot of planning that goes into that and a lot of forethought um, that you are inevitably going to ruin. Um, <clears throat> but the first major thing and the easiest thing for me is the major plot points that you're going to cover next session. Um, you sort of you have the whole story in your head, you have the whole story on paper in front of you, and you check and see where your party is in that story. And then you go, okay, we did this last uh, session, we covered this much, and then the next session, based on our pace, we'll do this, that, and the other. Um, <clears throat> and when you work on that stuff, there are a lot of things that you want to fold in, like NPCs are going to meet, um, NPCs are going to revisit, um, what Kay and I have done uh, in different games is we've actually pre-prepared some dialogue for NPCs um, <clears throat> and anticipated a lot of questions, and really that's the time to sort of flesh out the details of the plot for the next, you know, couple of hours. Um, and fun fact, your players will often go either faster or slower than you anticipate. I've had a combat encounter that I prepped and planned and was laid out that I had to wait three sessions for. Because I was like, all right, next session they're going to get to this combat encounter two more sessions went by before they hit it i was like okay that's fine but also um your players will sometimes move faster and it's okay to say to your players hey we got to stop here because this is the end of where i've like planned the fine details that has definitely happened to me as well and it happens to to all of us and you can also you know that's a great opportunity for especially if you've got a, uh, a roleplay heavy group or a group that really just enjoys you know, messing around in character be like, hey, we're, we're through what we got you know, we still got an hour left do y'all just want to do an extended camp? you know, do you want to do you want to keep going? you know, just in character knowing I've got nothing else or do you want to just wrap it and take an hour back in your day and I know I will always be like, oh, you'll just let us You'll just let us roleplay. We'll just sit in the inn, yep. and you won't be mad at us for not getting the stuff you prepped. Right. Um, and so, yeah, as a DM, the number one thing is, like, your plot stuff. Uh, but in addition to that, like I said, uh, combat encounters. Combat encounters are notoriously difficult to balance. Um, and so between sessions, it's a really good time to stop and really look at how your players have performed previously. Like, uh, I've got a player that notoriously uh, rolls poorly on death throws um, and also gets crit a lot. And so, you know, you got to plan around that. Um, unless you're purposely trying to kill him, then, then you know, don't. Um, but uh, actually... See David, I don't, I don't understand what you're talking about with, with encounters being difficult to balance. You just find your friend David and say, I want X, Y, and Z, and then it just works. And you might have to flub a little bit, but it just works. It, it is that, and we've, we've talked about 
co-DMing and collaborating before. Um, but that is one of the advantages is a division of labor. Like, you know, Kay does most of the work and then I run the numbers. Um, but the other part of that collaboration that really helps with combat encounters, and we could do a whole episode on like how to run combat encounters. Um, but, uh, there was a dab redemption for anyone yes, who's watching on YouTube time. and doesn't know. Yes. Thank you for the redemption, Todd. Um, and so when you divide that labor, you know, Kay says she foists it off on me, but I'll put together a combat encounter and then we'll sit down and we'll talk about it. And that, and Kay will bring up things that reminds me of my next point, which Oh yes, the shirt is top This notch. is a gift from my dear friend Cato, who knows me so well. David, write down where you were so you don't lose it. Look at this shirt. This shirt is top notch. This shirt is epic. Thank you, Cato. I've, I'm To this day, I'm not entirely sure if this was a late birthday present or if this was just a random present, but either way, it is just top tier. It's even purple. Right, right. Um, but uh, one of the things that that we've worked through is I'll build a combat encounter and then I'll present it to Kay and I'll be like, okay, so here's how it goes. Um, and Kay is is and has always been the lore master. She knows all the things about every system she picks up. Like she just. And so she'll go, okay, well, this particular skill breaks this whole encounter. Um, and that's another point that DMs need to really focus on in between sessions is take some time to review your player's character sheets. And if you don't have a digital copy of your player's character sheets, I highly recommend saying, hey, make me a photocopy, make me a duplicate so I can have it here because you want an I not and again I've, I've talked before about don't specifically build your combat encounters to counter um, your players but you do want to have an idea of what they can do and what you can throw at them that make a balanced encounter um, or at least makes the encounter that you are looking for because sometimes you don't want a balance encounter. Sometimes you want your level 12 people to m mow through a bunch of kobolds and zombies. Um, and like a swarm of flies or whatever. And just decimate everything. And but sometimes you want them to run into a gold dragon and be like, mm, maybe this is a little too spicy for me. That was real spicy. But also, you know, you... You want to know, you do want to give your character, your players and characters moments to feel powerful, but it also sucks to have prepped an entire session worth of combat. You were like, this is a big encounter. We're going to be here all day. You just, you just use one, one skill and, and that's it. It's over. It's done. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> paladins continue to be the best example of this because on the one hand you want to on the one hand you want to give your paladin a chance to use their abilities like if you have a paladin that has turn undead and they never run into a zombie that's why why would you do that to them but conversely if you plan a really tough encounter with a bunch of undead creatures and then a paladin walks up and goes i turn undead and everything scatters. And even worse, it's destroy here. undead. And everything's right. low enough CR that they just... It's not fun. <laughs> Steve says, Steve, I prepped I an entire casino and, par and the party decided to not go in after. I had terrain pieces and everything. That hurts my soul. Also... I will, I will circle back to that in a second. But... Our third co-host is making an appearance. Oh my god. Gilmore's purple bow tie is back. And he's being a bad stream cat right now. Um, but, you know, conversely... Oh God, he's going to knock everything over. Yeah, he is. 
Um, oh, you got lucky. You got so lucky. But... I'll, I'll do this thing so, oh, so the stream can be happy. Continue, David. Conversely. But you have, like, a druid or a hunter that has speak to or control animal, and you you plan, like, a whole horde of wolves or some sort of animal. Um, you know, a bunch of elephants come through, and that hunter druid says, hey, guys, calm down. Go home. And then they stop and turn around and go home. Then that's a two-hour encounter that you've just completely blown up. So it's important. If, yep. If you want an amazing example of how to deal with a druid who's just speaking to animals just all the time uh, look up Shakar which is uh, that bronze girls home game season 3 it's either the first or the second episode I think it's the second episode they're in a swamp there are these huge birds around the druid who doesn't even want to be talking to animals Gabe Hicks is talking to animals and Bronze's NPCs are all just top tier. Just watch Bronze to know how to do the most memorable and amazing. But the birds. Continue, David. Um, and uh, so yeah, so you want to know what they can do and know what they can't do. You know, you have like like someone builds a funky rogue where it's a rogue with low decks but high charisma then you don't want to necessarily give them a huge acrobatic channel uh, challenge, unless you do. But Unless you have a barbarian and a tiny ledge built for right. a monk, and the barbarian right. turns into a freaking ballet dancer. We're talking about god play. I'm still yes. not over that. In case I'm yes. Wondering. Yes. <sighs> so, between sessions, review everybody's character sheets, make sure that you're wizard isn't blowing through twice as many spell slots as they have as they actually have and also you know as you review previous encounters say hey wizard this particular thing was vulnerable to acid you have acid arrow or you have acid spray like that would have been a good time to um so the review of previous counter combat encounters the review of your character party makeup uh, is all valuable information as a dm um, and i will also take it a step further and say as a gm take the time to check in with your players and obviously check-ins are important right it did did that scene okay there was some in character conflict you all right yes all that i hate to say obviously because a lot of people it's not obvious and they don't do it, but um, there are other things to check in on too. Hey, we started this campaign and you said that your character really wants to bleh or your character is really believes in bleh. We're now 50 episodes in. You had this, or 50 sessions in, you had this conversation it, or you had this crisis. Are you still feeling that way? You know, I tend to build arcs to help my characters, you know, grow or work through things. And if the goal that I originally built an arc for isn't their goal anymore, that arc's not going to be very fun or impactful. And a lot of GMs, I think, are hesitant to reach out. Hey, Vivian, to reach out to their players and ask these questions because they feel the need to have surprise, right? They need to surprise their players. They're worried they'll telegraph it too much. I just checked in with one of my GMs because I'm like, hey, like this character, you know, I gave you this whole history about them. That's all about all these people that they met. And I realized we'd never discussed like their biological family. And I never said it, but I'm really not that interested in their biological family because their story is about all this stuff along the way and just to give the GM a heads up of like if you want to throw that in there you know I'm, I'm not going to not play with it but that's not going to be the impactful thing for me yes um, so yeah uh, definitely checking with your players for um, you know we just talked about God Plane uh, 
it is a horror campaign. The whole idea is to get under your skin, figuratively and literally. Um, and, you know, lots of creepy crawlies, lots of things that make you reflect upon the world that you live in. And while there are in-game systems in place that um, give the players an opportunity to express and interact with how their characters are feeling and what their characters are experiencing, you also need to do that check-in with your players. Um, like, apparently, uh, arachnophobia is more common among my friend group than I originally expected. And I put a bunch of spiders in a bunch of games, including Godplane. And uh, there's an element of like, by the way, I, I, spiders and me don't, mm. I'm like, whoops. Um, yeah. So no more Skutulas from Ocarina of Time, which to this day is the creepiest spider in the history of spiders. Um, I mean, there are ways you can work around that too. We talked about, you know, spiders can become crabs really easily. But also check in with that, because, you know, if it's if there's a certain movement to, like, the long... Like, sometimes people are like spiders, and you're like, cool, crabs? And they're like, oh no, that's actually... I, like, they have that moment of, like, if a spider is coming at me, or a crab is coming at me, it's the same gut reaction. I... David's met me. I'm a little... I'm a little difficult to, like, squick out. I've, yeah. I've seen some stuff. I've been you've around seen, seen the internet a time or two. Yeah, you Few things get to me. I almost threw my Nintendo Switch across the room while playing a Pokemon game. Because I'm in camp and my little Pokemon are running around and I have this grapple oct and I love it's this it's literally a grappler octopus. I love that thing. It's one of my favorite like Pokemon to use in a fight. It's ridiculous. It wraps one of its legs around itself so it has a championship belt. It's so dumb. I love this Pokemon so much. And so it's like hanging out like at the edges of the camp and I whistle at it and it like looks at me and then it starts crawling towards oh. me. Yeah, and I I'm like, no! <laughs> Didn't know that was gonna be a problem. Apparently it is. Still love that Pokemon, just will never have it in my camp ever again. Ever. But yeah, like, like, I've turned, I've had, I've been like, oh, you're not cool with snakes? Um, eels that are just flying through the air. And actually, a lot of people are, again, I think it's less a locomotion thing and snakes are just like, but yeah, talk to people. Because you might think, again, you might think you made it better. Oh yeah, there's not, there's not spiders. Now you're just being crawled upon by thousands of tiny crabs and they have little pincers. Like, that sense of alien might actually make it worse. And I'll also say, again, a lot of people are, hes a lot of GMs are hesitant to be like, hey, you know, we all said no to this, or we said no to this at the beginning. We're coming up on a thing where there could be, sometimes people are so into it, they're like, you know what? I'm buckled into the roller coaster. Throw the spider at me. No, it's, 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 don't describe it in great detail but I'm ready to try the spider. We found in Godplane, people were like, no, go harder. You could have pushed that scene further. I'm like, I could have pushed that scene further. I wasn't ready for the audience to go with that scene right. going further. <laughs> um, and all conversely, like the opposite happens in the moment as well. Um, because in a non-horror game, we're playing and you know i'm watching one of my players like visibly like implode and then after i'm like okay listen i went a little like nuts on what the evil people did to the orphan i'm not gonna get into details of what happened but i understand that i went a little i got a little uh got a little and it's, the sauce. yeah and and you know it's important to remind them hey it's okay for you to speak up and be like this is in this moment, this is too much. I don't need to know what's happening with all the viscera. And I'm like, listen, you gotta know what it smells like. 
You gotta know what it tastes like. Um, and so, in between sessions is a really good time to do that. Especially with, like, you know, we live in a modern era of text messages and Telegram and Signal and Discord. And, you know, I often reach out to all of my players individually between sessions to be like, hey, about this thing that you were doing, what do you think about that? About the spell you're cooking up, like, let's let's talk about it. Um, and those are all great opportunities to check in with them, see how they're feeling, see what squicked them out and what didn't, um, and to remind yourself of the 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 hard and soft stops that they have. And you know, again, double check with especially if you know someone has said so i have a weird i have a weird line i have a for most people it's a very weird line i don't like dogs dogs scare me i've had really multiple 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 bad experience with dogs i will fight a dog in your campaign if you throw a hellhound or a skeleton or something at me that's a dog i will fight it that's not a problem i have a hard line if i have to befriend the dog to advance the plot you're going on without me i'm, I'm not gonna pet the dog I am the opposite of that Twitter account. I want to not pet the dog. And I have to be pretty upfront about that because I was in a game where they're like, no, 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 the way to get in is the dog has to lick your face. And I'm like, then I'm not going. Not going if you got, if everyone else in the game, like this is, this is my thing. If everyone else in the game has a pet dog, you know, if there's a party pet dog, cool. Everyone else can play with the dog. I'm just not going to interact with it. That's fine. That's my, that's where my fun ends is when I am forced to do the thing. So I've had people, I'm like, hey, I won't pet the dog. And then I've had some people go like, come, James, come to me and be like, hey, so we're going to a section where there might be wolves. And I'm like, cool, I will fight them. I will not pet them. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, in, I won't say which one, because I've been in a couple now. In a, in a horror campaign, I died to a pack of dog-like monsters that just ripped pieces of my character apart. I'm... That's okay. That, to me, is better than having is to it, voluntarily go pet the thing. Yes, is it, is it okay, it. though? Because I went down... I took a lot of them down with me. Good. And we didn't go into detail about... He also did not really describe, so that was... Okay, because that, that... That sounds like something I would just triple down on. It was it was a moment where I'm like, these are dog-like things, right? And the jam's like, yeah. It, I'm like, no, keep going. You're fine, just don't... <laughs> Because right? they were not specifically dogs, but they were dog-like enough that as soon as I pointed that out, it was like, oh. Yeah, because, like, if your character dies in my campaign, you're going to hear about it. <laughs> they're, they're gonna, yeah, there's, there's going to be all sorts of information that you get about that event. So, so we Yeah, so, you know, if you're approaching something, you're like, this might be nearing someone's line. Or like, hey, we're heading to this person's hometown. Like, yes, they gave me some notes at the beginning of the campaign a year and a half ago. Check it. Hey, hometown, major people. Um, are there any family members? Because, like, B. Dave does this thing where he's like, you give me a character from your past, they might be a problem. Parents will always be proud of and supportive of you unless you tell me the parent that your dad is a dick. It's like, because too many people, too many times I've played a game and I've had the parent say, hey, son, daughter, I'm really proud of you. Give them a hug. And afterwards, the person's been like, I didn't know how much I needed that until after. He's like, so parents will always be not a parent. Odds are B. Dave's probably going to screw you over unless you go to B. Dave and say, hey, I really was close to this person. I really don't want them to secretly be trying to murder me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is something that uh, you have to be careful of because, you know, I love to go through people's backstories and be like, okay, what can I wield like a club against them? And they're like, but this person was pointing to me. Like, or um, going back to the dog thing, like, you know, you bring up an evil hellhound that happens to look like someone's 
uh, like, uh, like some ranger's, uh, uh, not pet, but, um, companion. companion animal. And they're like, oh, well, that's based off of the dog that I had, uh, growing up that I lost in the fire. And you, and now all of a sudden you're the dick. Like all of a sudden <laughs> you're the terrible person. Um, so it is important. So, so like, yeah, like, like, you know, when you check in with your players, check in with, you know, where they're going, uh, what they might come up with. Like I said, you know, review character sheets um, and whatnot. And also encourage your players to talk to each other. Um, you know, like I said, we live, we now live in an era where people could talk to each other whenever they want middle of the night here's some memes here you go um for better or worse and uh you know before tabletop was was a thing whereby people who didn't necessarily see each other often got together to hang out and so if you had a tabletop game once a month half of those players or all those players you might not see for a month in between well now in the modern era in the in the year of our lord 2022 you can you know communicate with the people and so you might uh, um, uh, uh, i was talking to a friend of mine and she was talking about how in a game that she has coming up she's planning with other players a polycule and so they've just been chit-chatting about how they're all going to fall in love or already be together when the story starts and you can check in with each other out of character and say hey are you comfortable with this i'm thinking about this next session but also your characters can interact um I, I, as a DM, try to end my sessions in one of two places, either during a rest or on the cusp of a plot point. <clears throat> and so you either do the, like, to be continued, and everybody goes, oh, what do you mean the session is over? Or um, you go, all of you go upstairs in the tavern, um, and this is the start of your log rest. Now you tell me what happens. But you telling me what happens often involves, you know, what... Because people forget that a long rest isn't just eight hours of sleep. It is some sleep plus other stuff. Um, and uh, I think you were talking last week about how uh, Orem is like just doing push-ups and sit-ups and stuff. Um, you could be communing with your god. You can be doing your scholarly research as a wizard. Um, you could be uh, a bard out performing for your daily bread. Um, but that also leaves room for character-to-character -character interaction or character-to-NPC interaction. Um, I have multiple NPC uh, I have yeah multiple NPCs that are pursuing um, uh, my characters for one reason or another and so that's a good time in between sessions to be like by the way while you're sleeping this note got slipped under your door or this note got left with um, the barkeep or you go downstairs to get bread and cheese or whatever you're eating for dinner and someone who wanted to talk to you is there um so there's a lot of opportunity there for players to interact with one another and to interact with you that you can encourage as a dm and that's where i'm gonna for our lovely little youtube chapter markers like this is our transition into what you can be doing as a player because as i said at the start for those of you just jumping here everyone talks about the matt mercer effect no one talks about the liam o'brien effect or the marisha ray effect uh, there is so much that you as a player especially if you're a performer and hoping to make at least something of a career out of your 
play can do to improve your games and make your GM a better GM, make your other players better players, and make your sessions better all around. Because uh, David knows that I spend a I spend a lot of time thinking about what's going on in my D&D games. And I am hydrating. Redemption. Mm, that's empty. That's so, not. So. Communicating with other players is really great, especially, so my Starfinder game, without giving too much away because we pre-record, so stuff that we're dealing with right now, you'll find out about in a month or two, I think. We've been a little stressed, and I never, personally, I don't view TTRPGs as like you versus the GM until there's a big battle. Right. Until the stakes are really high. And, you know, it you do reach a point where you're like, okay, we're coming up against a big bad. We're 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 gonna have to figure out how to outsmart our GM. The GM yep. has stacked this fight against us. Here's a channel that the GM can't see. Let's just start plotting. That's easy, right? I recently was asked, you know, by someone who said, I haven't played D&D in a long time, or TTRPGs in a long time, and I want to get back into the swing of it, and I want to be good, and like, what do I do? And of course, a lot of people are immediately like, read the rules, and like, yes, obviously, read your character sheet. It, learning the systems has never been easier, right? That's, and a good GM can, can help teach you that very, very quickly. If you want to be a stellar player, if you want to make your table better, the collective stories better, make your GM look like an awesome GM, and be the person that everyone wants to play with, the best thing you can do is when you are not talking, when it is not your turn, shut up and really listen. Don't be plotting your future move. Listen to what the other players are saying. Listen to what the other characters are struggling with. Listen to what they like. Take notes on what do they like, what do they notice, what do they complain about. And then you can bring that up at a later date. And that callback puts, gives you the chance when it is your character's turn. Okay, you've got time for a conversation. What's your character going to say? You can turn that spotlight on, hey, so-and-so, I saw you were having trouble with this. Or you do a delightfully fun thing. Like, again, I don't think the people who are in this game watch this, so I think I can talk about it. I've got a bard who's trying to impress another character, and they've been, they've written songs about the overly exaggerated heroic deeds this other character has done to try and trick children to give this character flowers. I just realized they like children, they like flowers. Told my GM I want to do this. GM and I worked out a system to see how if we could do this stealthily and how long we could keep it going. And the, the player at one point was like, I never said that this character likes flowers. And GM and I like locked eyes across the internet. We're like, nope, you didn't have to say it. You showed it. And then once you've gotten hooks, once you've started figuring out, I have so much fun with um, some of my fellow players when it's like, hey, so that session, like your character got really upset about that thing. Is there maybe, maybe it's a hint to the background. Maybe they were left behind before. Maybe they're questioning their God. Like we can have these fun out of character conversations about things that we've maybe not revealed or we've hinted at, and then we can figure out how to tell that story together. Like, oh, hey, my character's starting to question this. Maybe we can do a scene. Uh, I had said, I'll just come right out and say it, because none of y'all are. Uh, I have a Solarian whose name is Sol. No one's made a comment about how trotacular that is. And I mentioned this to one of their players, and they're like, maybe I should maybe my character can just ask. My character's the kind who just ask. I'm like, that would be a fun conversation. So you can start plotting things in characters. So when it comes to, okay, the two of you are sitting up taking watch. You're not going, 
nice weather tonight. And that's especially important if you were on a stream and you need, you might be thrown in situations where you two were locked in a cell together. You know, you can, what's something you disagreed about before? So that you can start bickering while you're looking for a way out, right? So you're not just like, okay, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this wall, I'm checking here. You can be like, this is your fault. If you hadn't done that thing three days ago, then, uh, but you know, and then I do the perception drug. So you can keep things really moving and much more entertaining if you take the time to notice what other players are doing, connect with them outside, and then start figuring out those plot points. And, you know, romances or um, frenemies, like there's all, I love doing frenemies and characters with tension. But doing that out of character check in between sessions of like, we cool, or like, hey, my character might make a pass at yours because they're just really bored. Are you cool with that? Is that going to mess you up? Like, it's really important communication to be doing between sessions. Because in session, especially if you're streaming, it can be real awkward. Right. And another important thing is some people are, are pantsers. Some people are like, I. I came up with a character name, I picked a class, I picked a race, go. Um, and even if they haven't, even if there are, you know, really well thought out, fully fleshed out characters, there could be an aspect to that character that the player hasn't necessarily thought about. And so, you know, in those moments, both out of character and in character, you could be like, ah, tell me about your family. And it's like, oh, well, I have a brother and sister. Well, what's your brother's and sister's name? And then like, you know, pinwheel. Because they hadn't thought that far. Um, and so by paying attention and talking to other characters and talking to other players, um, you can help that player fill in the gaps that they didn't know existed. And um, I'm, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say the thing that everyone hates, and this is it's I understand it's painful. I hate doing it. I have to force myself to do it. If you are a streamer, if you are a TTRPG performer, and your games are ever recorded or streamed, go back and watch the VOD. I know it's terrible. I hate it more than anyone I know. I hate the sound of my voice, but you realize so much about watching it back because you're so in the moment and when you're in the moment, and don't get me wrong, when you're performing especially, when you're playing TTRPG, the thing that you do is the right thing. Never let the paralysis of I have to do the perfect thing prevent you from doing a thing that moves the game forward because there is nothing worse than sitting at a table or watching a stream where nothing happens because people, someone has analysis paralysis and they don't know what to do and they can't make a decision. If it's an end character thing, if your character's like, I don't know, I can't decide, hopefully you've discussed that with your party and your party will help you out, right? But doing, the, doing a thing is always the right thing in a stream, unless you do something sexist or racist or just, you know, that's not the right thing, but But when you watch it back, you suddenly start realizing things that you missed. Or in my case, I have a character that I know really, really well. I know the inside of this character's head ridiculously well. I watched myself play this character on a stream, and while their actions made sense, I didn't explain the motivations behind. I didn't verb what they were thinking. And that was fine because their act, you know, it made enough sense but it could have been such a better experience for everyone watching if i'd given them an insight as to why the character was behaving the way they were and that was on that was my bad because i knew the character so well it didn't even occur to me to verb a lot of that out so you can start improving your performance picking up on things that you didn't pick up on before um and even realize like oh I may have interrupted that person a lot. I may have stepped over them. Nothing to do with my performance. Maybe there was a Zoom lag, but and I didn't notice it, but watching it back, oh, maybe I want to reach out to that person 
and let them know, hey, I realized I spoke over you. Zoom, like, I didn't mean to. You know, maybe we can work out, you know, are, are you okay? Did I upset you? Because you can pick up on a lot of things that will help your performance on that game slash that character in the future, help you build relationships because relationships are so important in this space and just make you a better performer all around. Once you start realizing, oh, I always jump to that as my default when I'm in a panic or I have to make a decision, maybe I should write down two or three other things on a sticky note underneath. So instead of always jumping to that, I can feel myself going for it and remember, oh, no, 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 I'll do this other thing so I can start breaking that habit or adding more spice to my performance. I know. It's not fun. It's terrible. And I'm I'm fortunate enough whereby I can leave the most of the reviewing of yourself as a player to K. But I do, um, and actually, uh, I think every every DM that comes to mind that I know that runs streamed games goes back and watches um, the the game after um, and I've done it as well and one of the things that I really like um, is you go back and you see something and you go that was a really cool moment that was really well done which wasn't necessarily um, prominent in the moment especially you know if you're running the game or you're playing the game or you're doing all sorts of things um, but then being able to follow up, you know, the next day, a couple weeks later, and message that person and say, hey, at this particular moment, this was really awesome. Um, because a lot of people watch, you know, a lot of people can't necessarily make a stream while it's going. And so they'll watch later. And I've seen a lot of people on Twitter and have even gotten a couple of DMs where people go, oh, this i'm watching this thing in this moment it was really awesome and that means a lot to your players um and helps encourage uh not just good play but adventurousness because i've reached out to people i've gone hey this 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 thing that you did here that was really good and they went oh i was really nervous about doing that but i went for it um and I didn't know how it landed, and a lot of other stuff was going on. Um, and I've had the so... exact opposite happen, where I my character took a risk, and um, someone out of character didn't like it, and it very clearly became like it was a case where there was an, an in character reaction to an out of character thing, uh, and I. I'm usually pretty good about believing in my own abilities and like sticking to my convictions, but more than once I've been like, I got, I got to pull back. You know, everyone is mad at me when only one person didn't like the thing that I did and it had no impact on their character. The people who it directly impacted were totally, totally into it. But because they didn't reach out and tell me, hey, I actually really liked it, I pulled back and they're like, oh, but like after the fact, they've been like, oh, but that was so cool. Why didn't you do that anymore? I'm like, oh, well, I thought everyone was mad about it. I'm like, no, I loved it. So reaching out and just, hey, I, you never know. You, we, we all get performance anxiety to some level. We all question. We all, mm, did I do, did I stay in character? Was that good? Was that bad? So... You never know when someone needs to hear that, so don't be shy to say, hey, I really enjoyed that moment. Yeah, and all of this stuff, especially like on the player side, circles back to um, communication. And I have to remind myself that things that I think are like brain dead and obvious aren't necessarily brain dead and obvious because you have a lot of people who are new to the space, a lot of people who are getting um, into tabletop and, you know, it's it's a new experience for them. And, and 
also not to but we also have a lot of people who were in tabletop for older systems uh, where communication and um, customizing, not just customize your character, but like flavoring your magic and flavor and heavy role play was not as common. So they're suddenly coming back and finding a changed landscape and they don't necessarily know all of the unwritten rules and all of the um, polite society kind of things that we do. So that's why we say them often and loudly. Continue, sorry. Um, and when I was... Uh, when when Kay and I were talking about this session and planning it out last week, um, one of the th things that I said to her and to myself was, "Review your notes." And it seems like, like for us, it seems like a brain dead thing because we're in the habit of building and extrapolating and expanding the TTRPG experience, but both as a DM and as a player, take time to review your notes. You know, as the session goes on, especially when you play um, extended home games, like uh, uh, the home game I play with K just eclipsed 53 and a quarter episodes or, or sessions. Um, and you know, you've referenced something, and then you think, oh, wait, that was January 2021. That was a long time ago. And even if it was something that happened that session or the previous session, and even if, you know, it's only a week or a couple of days between your sessions, stop and check the things that you wrote down. Um, not just to refresh your memory about what happened, but also to get a sense of what you felt was important in the moment. Um, because as a as a DM, I have so one of the tricks that we've talked about uh, before is seed way too many details for your players. Because you'll put 32 out there, and then your players will go, Oh man, remember that one thing that you did that indicated this was going to happen? And then you go, Yes, I remember that one thing that I let. There weren't 31 other things, it was just that one thing. But Portals. you'll do that. Right. You'll do that, and they'll be. You'll have four players, and you'll have four different bits of information that they keyed in on. Um. And you get the troll who's uh, doing, oh, they all probably connect in this one way that's clearly not correct. Right. So why, why do you all think that's correct? Oh, boy, this is going to be really fun. David's going to murder me. Right. And so, you know, as a player, knowing the sorts of things that you keep track of and then hearing about the things that other people keep track of will expand the sort of things that you pay attention to. And as a DM, knowing what people key in on helps you build out plot points in the future. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm guilty of throwing an NPC at someone and having it fall flat. And I'm also guilty of throwing a throwaway P NPC in a back corner somewhere and everybody's like, that, that person. I'm interested. And, you know, while you're playing, you make a note and you're like, the the person with the fangs and the third arm wasn't interesting. But the, uh, uh, but, you know, the dude in the corner who had nothing interesting about him like no scars like like the dude in the billowy white shirt in the bar is the guy that everybody's in then you go oh and then you can plan something in the future for that detail for that character uh for that interaction and you can call back to it or you can you know like we talked earlier about phobias you can be like oh this person got squicked out by blank, so I'm just not going to serve. And 
I do a lot of cooking for people who have various different dietary restrictions. Uh, vegetarians, vegans, people who are allergic to uh, certain types of fish, people who are allergic to certain types of um, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, people who have different preferences. And I really try to accommodate everyone. Um, but it's also a lot to keep track of. Like at one point there was a Thanksgiving where I cooked for a vegan, a vegetarian, um, diabetics, uh, Jews, uh, people allergic to fowl, um, and there was something, oh, and someone who was celiac. And to put a table of food for all these different interactions is is tough and so i had in addition to all the the things i was planning to cook i had a full-on eight and a half by 11 sheet with everybody's dietary restrictions that i referenced often um so you know do the same with your players if they have a thing that like especially like you know Kay and i run a horror campaign if there's a thing give yourself a cheat sheet and that's should be part of your notes that should be part of what you do as a dm and part of what you do as a player agreed and go back like there's there is nothing more empowering as a player than like flipping through your notes before the game start like just turn to an turn to an earlier page just flip just be like mm, that thing mm, that thing and there is nothing more reward or exciting than going, Everyone, remember blah, 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 blah from like six months ago? Doesn't that sound like this person? And then everyone lights up because, oh my goodness, yes, and we all forgot about that. But you not only took notes, you referenced your notes, and all of a sudden you're like, Ah, ah, I am Marisha Ray. Yeah. So, we've been rambling for a while. Um, these are our best tips and tricks. And again, if you, as a player, don't take notes, don't review your notes, show up. Yeah. Um, so what happened last time? Cool. Yeah, I'm going to go push some push button. Like, that's 100% a thing that you could do in a way to play. But if you're a person going, I expect a lot of my GM. I expect this world building and storytelling and development of blah, blah, blah. You gotta put in some of the work yourself. Because if you don't, if you show up with no thought and no conviction and no passion, your GM's gonna run out of their passion and their conviction real quick. If you're showing up and adding to lore, if you're showing up and uh, getting excited about the, uh-oh, why? What the heck? Uh, sorry, David, you don't see, well. Yeah, no, like, it's I think I think my camera's over here. Um, it's a heat wave, y'all. I'm gonna turn on a fan. Sauce said something. David, can you read off Sauce's comment? I know it was snarky. Yes. I shut down Kay's camera because she refuses to write my character's backstory for me. <laughs> that sounds about right, yeah. Okay, we'll see how long this lasts. Oh, and that reset my Zoom and everything. It's okay on the stream. That's cool. Um, uh, Sauce so says, I expect a lot out of GMK, and I refuse to do anything. Yeah, then you're just... I'm Well, okay. Sauce is still going to have a good time. Sauce brings his own chaos. Bring the same energy as your DM. Exactly, Moss Flower. Um, so, chat. We've rambled a lot. Before I ramble further, do you all have any tips, anything that you do between sessions that helps prepare you for the game or get you in the right mood or, you know, what what's your between session um, tips and tricks or routines that get you get you ready? Uh, Mossflower says, for me, it's been hard when the stuff I want to contribute doesn't align with what my GM wants to do. Uh, I'm sure better communication would help with that, too. Yeah. There's definitely, Dave and I have talked about, you know, I have a hard time with this because I'm like, I am a person of like, 
anyone can play D&D and there is there is a table out there for you. There is a game for you. There is a table for you. But sometimes your options can be limited. Sometimes you know, you find you, you find a set, you find a setting, you find a session, you find a game, you're excited. And what you want to do doesn't necessarily align with what the rest of the party wants to do or what the GM wants to do. Sometimes you're really into role play and everyone else wants this really gritty, realistic, quasi depressing. Like a lot of people I know right now are wanting to play or wanting me to play with them, which I'm flattered. I'm so happy people want to play, want me to play with them, but wanting to play in these like dark modern fantasy settings that are gritty and depressing. And I'm like, I've already lived through an, apo an apocalypse and, and my rights being taken away. I really am kind of at my max on dark, gritty, modern. I just, not even that I don't want, I, I can handle depressing. I just need fantasy depressing. I need to be depressed in another era right now. <laughs> and communication does sometimes help, right? Uh, and often just sitting down with your gym being like, hey, look, I understand that the rest of, like, most of the party wants this combat thing, and that's totally fine. I kind of want, I really want this, this roleplay thing, so is there an NPC that I could interact with? Could you just give me this little nugget, this little thing that I could have to help me continue to contribute and to maybe help advance the plot? That's absolutely a conversation you should have so you can keep enjoying your game. Depression with mead and magic, exactly. Um, please play my grim dark world where everyone is miserable and you die immediately from sepsis when you stub your toe. I mean, yeah, healthcare in America. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, both Kay and I have, have encountered, we go to run a game that's a one shot. It's like, okay, we've got three hours to get in and out. And then a player plops down a character and is like, I want to unpack all these things. Like, it's like, we don't have... 17 sessions to like do this yes. um and we've been really fortunate because every person that comes to our table is committed to working with us to make the best product to have the best performance um but we've also heard horror stories where somebody's like nope this is what i'm doing and this is what it's like we don't we don't we can't um and so there will be times when your um when your goals as a player to gm don't necessarily align um and especially in something that's multi-session that is on the list of things that you need to unpack with your players and your dm i really like especially when doing a campaign i will give my character my players the pillars of the campaign so um, for God Plane, it was Hidden Truths Revealed, Unlikely Friendships, and um, uh, uh, Redemption. So knowing that, everyone was able to kind of come in with an understanding of like, you're going to give me secrets, they're going to come out over this arc. Um, you, one, of the pill one of the cornerstones of God Plane is the characters don't know each other before the campaign starts. Your goal is to build friendships with these people. It's unlikely friendship. That's part of the pillar. If you're not willing to do that, this is not the game for you. Uh, David and I are working on a campaign where, like, the pillars are going to be, like, exploration and, like, uh, small town big heart. So that right there tells you a lot about what is this game going to be. You can have a Bilbo Baggins who doesn't want to leave the Shire. But it's on you as a player to make sure that this character will find, will keep stumbling. I, I love the straight man character more than anything. I love the character. Someday I want to play that trope. It is a goal of mine to play that character from the TTRPG tropes, who is like the druid weed dealer who never wanted to be an adventurer, but the like. A thing happened when he was selling weed and is now just part of this party and doesn't want to be there. I love it. I'm getting ready to play a cowardly character in a horror campaign. I am so excited. Like, but it is my job as the player to be like, this character is a coward. This is why they're still with this party. 
This character is a pot-dealing druid. This is the reason they're still with the party. Yes, if the GM absolutely, and often, look, David and I will both say, there are times you do things to absolutely frustrate or overwhelm or enrage your player characters, because that's part of life. And if you do that, and you really pull one over on your player, you really pull the rug out of someone, then yes, it is your job as a GM to work with them and make sure you can put their character back together in a way where they will be happy and stay with the party. But if you're like, I'm just playing a character who doesn't want to go on this adventure, so it's all of your jobs to convince me to keep playing. No. No, that is not what your character would do or say. That is you being a not very good player. Um, every... So, you know, for Zero Sessions, we write up a list of things that you can expect um, and, uh, you know, our philosophy and approach to gameplay. And I never have players sit at my table until they've read a particular rule that says no matter what two things are always true one for whatever reason you want to be a part of the party and two that you are committed to whatever lofty end goal the party has so if you're if you, if you want to play a rogue who steals from other players and eventually uh, frustrates and angers and pisses off the other players to the point whereby the rest of the group turns on you and tries to kill you, then you are not going to have a good time at my table, and I'm not going to have a good time with you, and go find a table where that's what they do. Um, and as I did a tweet today that's like, tell me about some of your favorite characters, and ooh, someone that I am, I am excited to hear their TTRPG stories because they're like, I play sneaky rogues and they don't pickpocket and steal from the rest of the party. They're high charisma, and they charm the party because after the big boss fight, they're gonna take all the loot for themselves and run off into the night. And I'm like, ooh, that would be yep. a fun. Yeah. And I'm like, and do that, but talk to your DM because I think that's hilarious. And what, I would do is I would go okay we could do this except after we're done like your character now becomes a DMPC and becomes the big bad of the next arc um, and that it could be this like you know you're chasing this rogue and the leftovers the remnants of the big bad's enclave are chasing you for revenge and that could be a really cool story but that's not the sort of thing that you like spring on people. Right. You gotta drop some hints. You gotta, even if people suspect, there's gotta be some foreshadowing or else it just sucks. Yeah. And also, again, you gotta have at least coordination with your, your DM. Those um, of you who have watched many of my one shots or short campaigns, I really enjoy a little bit of social deception some surprise lines but like I will work with the player to make sure that happens I need to know if you're going to try and spring it on me I mean if you're going to try and spring it on me there was someone who was like god one of my favorite stories was they get to the big bad the first big bad of the campaign right it's not the final big bad and um the wizard the big bad starts monologuing and the wizard's like that makes a lot of sense and the party's like what and they're like, yeah, I mean, that all sounds right to me. I cast haste on the big bad. And the whole party's freaking out and everyone's losing their minds. And then it gets to be the big bad's turn. And he says, I drop concentration on haste. Which means yep. the big bad loses a round and the party wallops this big bad because they have a round of no action. And apparently from that day forward, every single big bad had a 31 insight. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. That also, that's, that's high quality. 
it's that's just really good. Golden trolling. I've got I've got at least two of my GMs, maybe three or four. I don't know how many people are still lurking in here, and I have now ruined that tactic for myself. Yeah. But I will just have to find yeah. more GMs to hoodwink with a stolen right. idea. But you were saying something before I interrupted you. I'm so sorry. Um. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh yeah. So two rules. One, you know, you want to be a part of the party, and two, you want to proceed with the adventure. Um, because, like you, like you said, the idea of everyone has to convince this one party member to do the thing, and there are times where there are ideological differences and the direction shifts um, and in character you can have that conversation but ultimately at a table as a party if you're playing with me you all are committed to working together and you all are committed to working together for that goal as players not necessarily as characters and if you reach a point, and I know people who've been in really long campaigns, and they have their character has 100% reached the point where they got their goal, they met their goal, they've saved the world, they're happy, they're done. And the rest of the party is still going, and the GM's still trying to tell the story. And if that's the case, like, there is such a thing as you've told your character arc, you've done your thing, this character is done. And that, again, if you've reached that point, if you've written all the story that you and or this character want to tell, that's a good conversation to have with your GM because it's better for you to say, I should either bow out or come back with another character and work that in, than for you to sit there and go, no, I don't, no, I don't like that plot hook. No, I don't want to go. No, I don't want to. Even if everything that you're feeling is valid, that brings down the energy at a table. We talk improv is yes and or no but. So if, like I said, I was talking to GM and it's like, I don't necessarily care about the biological family of this character. That is not a thing this character is, is out to, check, to hunt. If something shows up and is like, hey, we might know where your biological family is, right? If I hadn't had that conversation or even so, if it, maybe the GM has this plan for the next session and I said it too late. If someone says that, I'd be like, okay, but I'd rather go find this character from my past. Okay, do you think they have a connection to so-and-so who I've been avoiding for years and maybe now is gonna come ruin this new thing that I've built? That gives so much more energy to like, no, I just want to stay home with the new castle that we just won. Because, hey, we got a castle. Why would I leave it? Right. But you That's definitely my energy. Valid. If you've got a castle, why would you leave it? But that probably means you're not living the life of an adventurer. So go find a character who's living the life of an adventurer and stop making your GM pull their hair out and wondering if they're a really bad GM when really you're just done. That's yeah. fine. We have gone on for quite a while. Chat, do you have anything else to add? Um, any questions about anything that we've rambled about? Um, so the first half, we really focused on what you can do between sessions as a GM, which, you know, I, it's valid. It's also decently well known, but bears repeating. And the second half, we did, you know, what you can and probably should be doing as a player to help your GM tell good stories to I, I there's no happy in between with this light I am either like kind of yep. orangey shadowed or just like Psh. so here this is where we are welcome to 2022 yep. um, first world problems I will complain about this one um, yeah between sessions especially like one of my games is bi-weekly and we actually get together on off weeks more often than not to play games and chit chat about our characters. I even, David knows the story. I can't tell all of this story. I had a fun story. If you watch, if you, or if you watch, can't watch it. If you listen to the Starfinder game that I'm in, Emergency Power Podcast, 
we have a guest character who's this weird kind of goopy alien and they like pick up things and absorb it into their body just completely absorb it and it comes out super clean and one of my really good friends jess irl friend we worked together uh, we did worked really long day and we ended up she was crashing at my place and we were you know when you're too exhausted to sleep we were doing that too exhausted to sleep wind down and i was just blabbering about the characters in this game because i love i love para so much para is such a fun character and I was trying to explain, like, black and goopy, but everything comes out super clean. And she was getting ready to get her septum pierced. And so there was this, I won't repeat it, because I don't know if she's okay with my repeating it on the internet. But it was like, you know, Para should work at a piercing studio, because they would just keep everything clean. And it would be the best piercing studio in the world. But she said it in a really funny way. And it spun us off into a whole conversation about other things. And I got to sit down and talk with the player. I was like, hey, you won't believe what my friend said when we were talking about your character. Number one, friend was like, I'm so flattered that you like my character enough that you're talking about it to other people. I'm like, heck yeah, I love it. Number two, that spun us off into a whole talk about, well, could we do this in game? Could we make this a thing that happens in the game? It's a maybe, we don't know if we'll get to that point. I may be trying to force it to happen. But it's certainly something that wouldn't have happened had we not had that conversation. So, again, between sessions, talk, communicate all the time. Check in. Check in about not just lines and veils and squicks. Check in about your character said this. Is this maybe a thing we could talk about? I noticed you did this. Do you want me to help you bring it up? Hey, I noticed that our characters are kind of really on the opposite end of this like spectrum this morality thing around this how do you want to handle it right do you want are you cool with some spicy in character conflict or do we really need to like work it out like how is how are you feeling because i love in character drama i love in character drama I love when you and I, out of character, know that we're going to throw down in character and we throw down in character, then it's like, oh my god, that was supposed to be, are you okay? I'm okay, oh my god, can you blow? <laughs> that is joy to me. But I need to make sure that we're on the same page because I don't want to be like, hey, we agreed six months ago that maybe we can have some spicy in character drama, but I don't know that you've had a really bad week. So when we go to throw down, you take it personally because I was operating on old information. So do all that between sessions. Check your notes. And if you're a performer, it hurts. I know it hurts. If you're a performer, if you're a GM for a streaming show, go watch old episodes. You'll learn so much about your own performance and do so much better. Saw says, I always assume I only exist within my own perception and people never talk about me without me present. Well, yes, Sauce, that is completely true. 100%. David says, uh, all the conversations Kay and I have had about you certainly haven't happened. Yes. Not once. Not once. Never. No. No. The uh, TTRPG community definitely doesn't talk about both awesome and bad people constantly. Right. Right. It's, it's not oui. It's not a space where uh, everyone knows what's up. Um, what's the line from Letterkenny, bad gas travels fast? <laughs> um... But I'm one one thing that I'm very happy about as I get further and further into the tabletop community is how much great people in the space, both in front of and behind the camera, are really celebrated. Like I hear more about artists who are doing great art both for the stream and like as fan art um, and musicians who are putting things together um, than in many of the other spaces that I've I've spent time in like in the video game community it's it's a fairly recent thing that outside of the biggest names in video game music um, like you know the guy who did the Final Fantasy music and the guy who did the music for Doom there are 
there are people who are starting to emerge as like notable names in the community um but i feel like the the sort of like non-performer creator aspect of the community is emerging a whole lot faster than in say you know the the indie video game community yeah so i think that about wraps up our discussion unless chat throws up something else i should probably wrap this up before my camera overheats again <laughs> right <laughs> heat wave right hilarious uh, um david again tell us what this show is and where you can find it the chaotic wholesome talk show featuring Kay and myself you can find us here tuesday every tuesday um occasionally with extra people um and next at, week uh, uh but yeah occasionally with other people all at 6 p.m eastern 3 3 p.m pacific where we talk about uh ttrpgs how to's um spicy topics that we come across and all with a lens of diversity and inclusion and intersectionality and next week we're going to have a special guest i am so excited that i can post this advertisement we're gonna have carrie the amazing carrie 2012 hanging out and talking to us about what's going on with her you might be seeing more of Carrie too. I am very, I am so hyped about what the future is holding. Uh, that's David Lee. You can find him online at Full Rubber Ducky. And here on Tuesdays, you can find me. Hi, I'm Kay. I am here on Tuesdays. I am also on the Twits at at KDamnFear. It should it'll flip over in just a moment. It's it's not right now. Um, you can also find me every other Wednesday if you listen to the Emergency Power podcast. That is a Starfinder homebrew actual play podcast. No knowledge of Starfinder is required. It's in its third season. What's cool is, because we brought in two new characters, there are not only audio recaps and uh, text recaps, so you can jump right in at season three if you want. We also accidentally on purpose but mostly accidentally like did a great recap of the really important things of the first two seasons um in uh, within one of the first two or three episodes of the season so that was pretty great so uh I have another question about the shirt i have to go back this shirt was a gift from my dear friend kato and it is one of the best shirts on the internet i love it and it's purple and it's great and it's Mimi, and it's X-Men. It's all the things I love. Uh, so thank you, Kato. Uh, there's a lot more that I'm going to get to talk about really soon, but none of it's announced yet. And I know yeah. like some people hanging out are really excited to talk about this stuff too. But David and I also have some things in the works. So like, buckle up. There's going to be some fun stuff. If you were hanging out, thank you so much for hanging out. Chat, you were amazing. You are always amazing. Your comments, your topics, it's great. Please keep them coming. Uh, if you have topics or things you'd want us to talk about, I have a Discord, I have a Twitter. Please, please, at me. Uh, post in the Discord. If you are watching this on YouTube, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We've actually had really good YouTube traction recently. You're amazing. Uh, be sure to hit that subscribe button. <laughs> yeah, like uh, and remember to like and subscribe. Ring that bell. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, yeah, thank course. you yeah. for subscribing on YouTube. Um, thank you for your comments. Uh, again, if you were watching on YouTube, you, you don't have to be watching live to be like, hey, I really want to know more about blank. We appreciate all of your feedback whenever and wherever it comes from. And we thank you for hanging out. Um, also, we have a ton of people who are lined up to come on the show, but if you have any topics that you want us to talk about or something that we've covered that you want a deeper dive into or a different angle about, please hit up K and I on Twitter or in the Discord. Um, let us know what you think. Uh, many of the topics that we've covered on the show have been recommended by viewers so mm -hmm. it really does uh make an impact and it will show up and uh yes thank you for joining us through these early days 
Uh, we've had, I think this might be our 20th episode, actually. And Possibly, we've only yeah. got more coming, which is really cool. So, Bronze Girl is doing some chatting right now, so we're going to send you all over to her because she is amazing. She's the GM on Dimension 20, on uh, D&D Beyond, and Run Shikar, which is one of my favorite actual plays. So, thank you all again for spending your Tuesday with us. Thank you for your questions and your passion and your input. You're all amazing. And we will see you back here next Tuesday with Carrie. Ooh, Bye, y'all. Thanks. Thank you.